Have you ever thought about your life being a part of a bigger plan? The, 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 the sovereign God has a master plan and you, yeah, you, struggling with your bills, going through this, raising three kids, grandma, you are part of that plan. You see, God has a plan and that plan is always working. And I believe that he connected us for this divine moment to let you know by the spirit of God that you're part of the bigger plan of God. You see, as we look at our nation, we look at the world, we know that these are transitional times. We know that wickedness and the spirit of Antichrist and that, that spirit of Amalek and that spirit of Agag, I'll explain that in just a moment. That spirit of Haman, the destroyer, wants to destroy the children of God, those that are in covenant, from taking away our religious rights and religious liberties, from taking away our worship, to shutting down the church doors, to so much worse, martyring those who stand in faith and stand for God. But could it be that you're God's answer? Could it be that you're God's chosen? That you are the same company and have the spirit of Esther. I don't believe Esther is just a female, it can be a male, it can be a young person, an older person. And I believe just like there's a company of Joseph, there is a company of Esther that has been raised up for such a time as this. You see, I believe the greatest revival will come to this land. And according to Habakkuk 2.14, that the glory of the knowledge shall cover the world and cover this land as the waters cover the sea. But how, Paula? How? See, God has taken care of that in his sovereign plan but we have to do our part and fulfill the role of destiny, God's decision in the earth. How do I know if I'm an Esther? How do I know if I've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Well, let's look at God's word and see. You see, when he says, who knows, Esther chapter four, verse 14, if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, the word have come means to lay your hand on, to reach, to arrive, to strike, which means to punish, to defeat, destroy. So it means, have you arrived? Have you laid your hand on the kingdom, the domain, the dominion, the rule, the reign, the royalty of God? So I believe if I'm talking to kingdom people, someone who knows that, that God has given you the keys to the kingdom, the royalty, the rule, the realm, the kingdom of God, you've laid your hands on to do what? To execute the judgment of God in this earth to the enemy by the appropriation of the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? To punish, to strike, to defeat the enemy. You see, you know who you are in God. Maybe you don't live in the fanciest home. Maybe you don't drive the biggest car. Maybe your name's not in spotlights. But you, like Esther, have appeared, have come forth out of Christ to strike, to punish, and defeat the enemy. Oh, Paula, I'll never preach before a camera like you do or do this. No, 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 no. That's not the essence of the fullness of ministry. See, your prayers matter. Your giving matters. Your fasting matters. How? Show me. Ask Esther. So let me give you the backdrop. When we begin to look here in the book of Esther, which there's only two books named after women, it's really an interesting thing. We see where there's this divine moment that God has set up through sovereignty. By the way, when it says you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this, the word for such a time means due season. It's from the root in the Hebrew of odd, and it means eternity, everlasting, old world without end. What it's saying is that God is forcing eternity in the earthly through a vessel that he has chosen to release the choice, decision, and intention of God. Could it be that you have come to appear, lay your hand on, watch, strike defeat, hurt, punish the enemy from eternity into the earthly chosen by God? Let's sum that up and see how it happened. So in Esther, we see the first five chapters tell of the providence of God. And God through his providence, God through his choosing, because when God chooses you, it doesn't matter what man thinks about you, what man has to say about you, what man says you cannot do or you can do. In fact, he'll scratch his head and say, how is she still there? How does she do this? How is she a part of that movement of that moment, God, in his providence? So the first five chapters tell about the providence of God, bringing this Jewish orphan to the throne. It tells me that God can take you from a, a trailer 
to, to one of the highest places, not just in the nation, but in the world for his glory, for his kingdom. It says that your past does not dictate your future. It says just because there's been brokenness does not mean that God cannot bring forth beauty for his glory and his name's sake. So God is going to raise up this, this young girl by the name of Esther. And he's going to raise her to a prominence of queen. Now, how does this happen? Vashti, who is the reigning queen, and watch this, refuses to display her beauty. And because she refuses that before the king and all his men, she was disqualified for rulership. She was disqualified. You know, often when we don't display the beauty of God for the king in the earth, we're disqualifying ourselves. There's so much depth to all this. The king wanted and desired one who would show forth his virtues and show forth his praises. And our king still wants this in a time that it's counterculture and it's a woke culture. And people are saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. God is saying, somebody show forth my praises. Don't stand on the sideline and say, I'm just a God of the universe of spiritualism. His name is Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And he's looking for someone to stand and display his beauty and his virtues, his virtues. Because when wrong is being consumed by almost everyone, God says right is right in the midst of wrong if no one's doing it, and wrong is wrong if everyone's doing it. The Bible is our ultimate guide and compass. So Esther, after the king calls all these women from all these Persian providences to come forth, Esther is chosen, but before she gets that position, she's first purified. Any of you go, what have I been going through? It seems like, you know, my friends left me or forsake me. I, God wouldn't even let me be a part of this, or I was going through that. I was rejected over here, or he took me into consecration, and people make fun of me because I'm always reading my Bible. I'm watching Christian television. I can't listen to those other things. Purification. Who shall ascend into the holy hill of the Lord? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart, a catheterized one. So God says, I've done the process. I've been purifying you. She was prepared to draw near to the king because you never step into that position without being cut in advance, which is what preparation is. While all the other girls are being adorned with trinkets on the outside, the Babylonian trinkets and treasures, Esther obeyed the voice of Haggai which is a type of the Holy Ghost, for, she knew, for he knew what pleased the king. She was prepared for God's purpose, the solution to the problem. You see, there was this eternal enemy of God. And, and there, in my lifetime, I mean, I've seen some things, but the kind of global, and boy, we talk about a global pandemic. We're talking about a global spiritual crisis, the type of global pressure that, that is on Christians in every place in nations and countries and around the world, the kind of persecution that's happening from what looks like a small to, to literally people having to decide between life and death. In all my years of serving the Lord, 38 years of ministry, the intensity of it is tremendous. The pressure of it is great. And watch, there was an eternal enemy. He'd been an enemy of God, not this particular person, but this particular spirit operating through this vessel had been an enemy against God and his people for a long time. Well, it seems like there's a manifestation in the earth, I believe, for a reason. I believe the greatest revival, the greatest rescue, the greatest restoration's ahead of us, but we have to deal with Haman. So who's Haman? Haman means the rager or the destroyer. And that is what exactly happened. Look at woke culture. Look at this counterculture. Look at governments. Look at what we've gone through. Where's the greatest persecution come to? Particularly Christians. And that's just fact. That's absolute fact. People of faith, but particularly Christians. There's a raging, there's a destruction to try to stop the body of Christ from moving forth to stop, try to stop you, Esther, and the Esther company from rising up for such a time as this, but the devil is a liar. I break fear off your life, intimidation. Just like Esther, may a boldness come over you that says, if I perish, I perish. And so watch what happens. Haman operates in the flow of his eternal nature. The Bible says this, that after these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, the son of of Hamadatha the Agagite, write that down, elevating him 
and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of other nobles. Now watch this from a spiritual perspective. That spirit that is raging of destruction, did the king know he was a destroyer? No, but we're dealing with the realm of the spirit. Did the king know that he was a waster, that he was, a, he was raging? No, and he elevated that spirit of Haman has been elevated in the earth. And he comes from the Agagai, which means Agag was the king of Amalek. Agag means I will overcome. So it's a spirit antichrist. It's a spirit against God that comes to destroy God's people, comes to destroy everything that is good, everything that is holy, listen by the spirit of God, everything that is pure, everything that is right, everything that is virtuous. Think about it. It comes to mock God, destroy, thinking it is God, saying I will overcome. The devil is a liar. And all his operatives will be brought down. Esther, you've been raised up for such a time as this. Your prayers matter. Your fasting matters. Your participation matters. You are carrying greatness on the inside of you. you. Say, but I'm just a little girl. I was orphaned. I'm just a humble little Jewish girl. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, God has chosen you. And so here Haman is. The Amalekites were eternal enemies to God. You studied in Deuteronomy 25 and see it because they always attack the feeble, the weak or the unsteady, the exhausted from the journey. There are so many people that we're losing in the body of Christ because they're simply exhausted. They're simply, it says that 83% of pastors burn out. That, that almost 90 something percent of pastors, think about this, that the sheep get scattered without a shepherd. That over 90% feel that ministry is more a burden than a blessing in their life. It's affecting their family, their mind, their body, everything. This is since, and that's all out there on Barno and everything else. So what happens here? You see, this enemy, Haman, says, opportunity. It's all very demonically, and I also believe, sovereignly orchestrated for our time. So God's attitude was always, blot them out. And it, you see in Esther chapter 3, 500 years after we see Haman and Amalekite doing what they'd always done, trying to destroy God's people. So now 500 years later, a lot about that number, in Esther chapter 3, verse 9 through 10, if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. So the king took a signet ring from his finger, gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the destroyer, the one for destruction, the enemy of the Jews, the enemy of God's people. You want to know what? As we approach Purim, I declare in the name of Jesus that whatever declaration, whatever has been issued out, whatever demonic covenant, whatever demonic exchange has happened with entities, governments, people, nations to come against God's people, to destroy them. Why aren't we rising up about the many Christians that are being martyred around the world, about the gospel being squandered, about churches being closed, about religious liberties being taken and your voice being minimized? We must, Esther, Recognize what we're sent to such a time as this. When Haman decreed destruction, Esther drew near again. I challenge you right now, draw near. She put on the robe, royal apparel. You must know who you are. Don't flounder, don't wander, don't vacillate during this time. Don't flounder around and saying, I don't know, flesh versus faith, flesh. No, in the name of Jesus. It is in Christ I live, and I breathe, and I move, and I have my being. I'm a child of the Most High God, chosen by God, an heir with God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I I've been sent into the world for this time. She puts on a royal apparel. You must be cloaked, cloaked with the Holy Spirit, washed by the blood of Jesus, wrapped in the righteousness of God. You must know who you are, your royalty in your position through Christ Jesus. And then you can approach the throne with confidence, with boldness, with fearlessness. Her Jewish name, Esther, has so much meaning. I've taught some of it. It means Hadessa, the myrtle tree. It comes from the bottom because God often raises up people from the bottom. It literally means the overlooked area. 
You see, people may overlook you. They might not see you. They might not think you're much. But God says, I'm going to use you. I've called you out. I've called you in for such a time as this. Then the Bible declares this. It says that the Hadessa means evergreen. It's something that retains freshness and interest. Job chapter 19, verse 18 through 10, 20 says, Then I said, I shall die in my nest. I shall multiply my days as the sand. My root was spread out by the waters, and the dew lay all night upon my branch. My glory was fresh in me. Hear this prophetic word. And my bow was renewed in my hand. Fresh means new not faded, not worn. See, the enemy's messed up. He thinks that you're an old wineskin and that you're old wine. But you might be a wineskin of old, a structure that has not lost the foundation, but there is new wine being poured out. And I'm telling you, there's a freshness, there's a revival, there's a fire, there's a love for Jesus that is being spread in your heart and in your body and your soul and your mind. You're not faded, you're not worn out. People are gonna go, where did they come from? Where did she come from? The myrtle tree understands what it is to remain fresh. Esther understood freshness. They never lost its leaf. They were constant in season and out of season. One of the most important things about Hadessa, Esther, her Jewish name, is it had white blossoms, the myrtle tree. White is symbolic of purity. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 8. Let thy garments be always white. And let thy head lack no ointment right now in the name of Jesus. I just thank you that the garments that you wear because of the blood of Jesus are white, that they are always white. There's a pureness. There's a freshness. There's a holiness. There's a goodness because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. But with that, let thy head, let thy head lack no ointment. Let the power of the Holy Spirit fall upon you right now. You will fulfill the, the promise, the plan of God. You've been called for such a time as this, raised up to fulfill the decision of God, your destiny in the earth by a Kairos moment. Esther, don't draw back. If you perish, you perish, but you won't perish because there's an eternal enemy it's out of Agag, just like it raised its head 500 years later and God raised up in Esther. God is not without those who will go and defeat this enemy. It is a spiritual battle. Your prayers matter. Your fasting matters. Your participation matters. It is time that the kingdom of God suffers violent and the violent take it by force. We sit on the side and just watch generations go. Will you watch them take into captivity and destroy, destroy the minds, the hearts, the purity of a generation that won't even know God? Or will you stand up for righteousness? Will you stand up for Jesus and stand up in covenant with God for such a time as this?